טוב, ברוכים וברוכות הבאות אה, לאירוע הפתיחה של אה, תערוכה אה, של רות שרייבר במסגרת הביאנלה של ירושלים 2021. In the entrance to your exhibition, right. maybe you want to give us like a general description? What you yes, sure. See? This is an exhibition about uh, ways that people are making babies these days in Israel and the rest of the world. And I think it raises many different questions. Uh, we're not controlling exactly where the sperm is coming from and where the eggs are coming from for those who are not making babies, just one man and one woman on their own together. So that's my subject, with a look also at the halacha, at the Jewish legal aspects of this. And I'm just raising lots of questions. I don't have any answers, but I'm shining a light on the issue. So here we have two screens, each showing two videos. Mm -hmm. And this is the core of this exhibition. I interviewed several people. I interviewed two single mothers, one religious and one secular. I interviewed a lesbian couple. I interviewed a gay couple, two men. Mm -hmm. And I also interviewed a man who is a known sperm donor, named sperm donor to uh, two lesbians. And f out of these interviews, I created four animation videos mm -hmm. with photographs and with voiceovers. I've used the voiceovers of other people mm -hmm. to maintain the anonymity of my interviewees. I was approached by a friend of mine and asked by her if I would be a sperm donor for her and her partner, both women, and be involved in some way in raising the child. The initial response from my kishkas was yes. Once I said yes, we sat down to meet with a therapist, and then we sat down to work together on the contract. So it's not legally binding, but notarized and agreed by us. That took quite a while, and at some point we started going into hospitals to begin IVF. So this is a couple. One of them asked me to be the father. She ended up being the mother of one of the children. And then there will be two kids from the other mother, and I'm the father of those two as well but it took a long time, attempt after attempt. There aren't any Jewish halachic aspects. The kids are halachically Jewish, I'm halachically Jewish, and the mothers are both halachically Jewish. The kids were not conceived in marriage, but they are not mamzerim. The two mothers are the primary parents. They consult me on the bigger decisions. They also stand all the costs. They're big earners and don't require any financial contribution from me. It took a bit of acclimatizing, but my parents and siblings have been supportive, and they're happy for me as a gay man to have children of my own. The kids live mostly with their mothers, but I have space for all three too, and they often spend weekends or holidays with me and come with me to my shul, and so on. I'm their Abba. I try to attend their special events in and out of school, as they've grown older, I find that I prefer to have them stay over one at a time, rather than all three staying over together. The situation has become more complex, as a few years ago, the mothers split up, not entirely amicably, and the younger one has a new partner. All the women involved are good parents to the children, who are coping well with the change, and the kids are not aware, not yet at least, that the new partner is a transgender woman. Recently, one of my kids told me, Abba, I met someone with a family that's even more complicated than ours. 
S and I have been together for 10 years now. About five years ago, we started thinking about having a baby. I knew I wanted to. I'm 10 years older than S, and I was turning 30 then, and the time seemed right. I went to a sperm bank, but was totally freaked out about the anonymity of it. They tell you about the man, but won't show you pictures of him. So then we approached a gay man, a friend of ours, who was willing, but his partner hated the idea, so we dropped it. Then we bumped into our friend M, a straight, single, disabled man, and he said, sure, I'll do it. We had to make an appointment at Meuchedet, or wherever you go, to get checked up, so that takes a while until you meet the doctor, and then if you have the sperm donor, if you know who it is, they make sure that the man is tested for AIDS and other illnesses, and that takes a while, and then they check for genetic compatibility also. The man has to sign a paper that he acknowledges, that he understands, that it is his child. The courts will always favor the child. You can't just say, this is not my child. We had to write up a contract. It shows intent that M has no obligations and no rights, which is what all three of us wanted. We had a lot of conversations about this during that half a year of meeting. We took the sperm to Meuchedet and they shoot it right in. We had IUI. It was miraculous that we got pregnant on the first try. Really miraculous. The doctor, everyone was shocked because it's unheard of. I'm overweight and with his low sperm count, it was amazing. Em is very involved with our daughter, comes a lot for Shabbat and Chag. It really works well. Our daughter coming into our family was a big change as far as my siblings go. They accepted her very readily. With S's family, it took a lot longer. People have different reactions. I explained to my siblings that it's very important for me that you know that for me, our family comes first. This is our child. She's S's and my daughter. She has two mothers who have the same bed and the same bank account and are in charge of her in the same way. It was very, very important to me that they understood that for me, nobody is more valid than anyone else. I have like zero tolerance towards intolerance. I generally think highly of people. I respect them, but I don't think anyone has a right over anyone else's life. No one, not your parents, not your siblings, not your child, not anyone. I told my siblings, we are secure in our decision. If you agree to that and you understand what that means, think about it. Know what that means. It means that your kids are going to see us touching each other. They're going to see us the way we are. We're not not doing anything because you are worried about your children. I'm not looking for anyone else's validation. I don't need to validate anyone else and I don't need anyone else to validate me. Maybe others do. If you're just coming out of the closet or whatever, maybe some do. But I grew up here. I know everyone here. It's hard to rattle me here. Maybe if I was somewhere else, I'd feel differently. I know every corner here. I know all the stores. I know everyone. This is my neighborhood. Jerusalem is the best place to be a gay person in general, and certainly a gay person who affiliates themselves religiously. Tel Aviv is lovely, wonderful, fine, great. I lived in Tel Aviv for a few years, but Jerusalem is much more open than Tel Aviv because there are so many people who are learning here, lots of different people thinking about things and truly thinking about what they're doing religiously. And you know, there's so many different kihilot you could find here. Everybody asks me all the time about us being datiyim and our families are dati, but it's not like everyone Dati is the same. They're making a lot of choices about life and how to behave. And so are we. I had decided that if I wasn't married or in a relationship by the time I was 40, I was going to have kids on my own. When I was 39, I figured there wasn't going to be a relationship. So I started the process. I went to my general practitioner and asked her for recommendations here in Israel. I mean, 40 is a little bit old to be doing it, although there are a lot of 40 years olds and older wanting to have kids. 
getting to a certain age and not having a partner and wanting to have kids. Lots of younger people, as I saw with myself, don't think about it. When you're young, you can always freeze your eggs. As the younger your eggs are, the easier it is. But it was just when I reached 39 that it made the difference. I decided that if I'm ever going to do it, I better get on with it. Yes, the clock was ticking, but you never really think about that until it's getting late. I decided to choose my sperm donor through the hospital as opposed to going to a private sperm bank. The profiles are very limited here in Israel. The profiles, or at least the information that you're given about the sperm donors, is very limited. They don't show you photos of the men. Based on what I thought I'd like, I chose someone, and then it's a matter of being available or not, because they also limit the number of women who can use the same donor. It didn't matter to me whether the donor was Jewish or not, although he is Jewish, and the child was going to be Jewish for sure anyway through me. When the time comes, my children can always do a DNA test to prevent the possibility of incest or mum's root. My son is my first child, and four years later, I use the same sperm donor for the twin girls. If asked, they say they don't have an ABBA, and they go to a school that's very open with lots of different kinds of families, where there are two Imas, two Abbas. Every so often, they ask, do they have an ABBA? Will they have an ABBA? And my answer is, I wanted them so much that it couldn't wait for an ABBA to come. I see in my girls' class, there are a few different sorts of couples. Some kids that have two mommies, and now the mommies are in new relationships, so they can have three or four mommies. I didn't consider halachic issues. No, n- not at all. I had everything done on the kuppah. It's pretty amazing. I know that for lots of people outside of Israel, it's not so easy because it's a very expensive process. And even through the kupa, it is an expensive process because not all the medications are covered and you have to try different hormones and some are more expensive than others. With the kupa, the way they do it is you first do IUI, which is in utero. And if that doesn't work after so many times, then they'll move to IVF. For me, birth times, it was IVF that worked. In Israel, you're not allowed to contact the sperm donor. To me, he's not a father, he's a sperm donor. He was never involved in the process. He was generous enough to do this, but maybe in retrospect, from his point of view, it was a foolish kind of thing because usually the sperm donors are young and short of money. You hear stories of men who've done it, and then years later, these kids have come out looking for them and saying, You're my father, and he's now married and has his own family. My partner and I met a woman at a bar who told us about a surrogacy process in Nepal. Now, surrogacy is illegal in most of the world, same-sex surrogacy. So there was an option in Thailand, but that's been stopped. And there was India, and that was stopped. And in Nepal, there was a loophole. In Nepal, surrogacy was not illegal, only surrogacy by residents of Nepal. So women came from India to Nepal and became surrogates. The women are in an egg donor agency in the Ukraine, and there is an Israeli agency that works with the Ukraine agency. You acquire the services of an egg donor who travels to the relevant destination. The eggs arrive fresh, the sperm arrives frozen. And then they are fertilized on the spot. In other words, you take the sperm, defrost them, create the total amount of embryos possible from the ova. In our case, the donor was very fertile and provided 24 eggs, which is like insane. So we divided them up. 12 eggs were fertilized with my partner's sperm and 12 with mine. You see what survives. So we got something like eight embryos for me and seven from him. They took three strong ones from each and perform 
an embryo transfer in two parallel surrogates and see what it takes. Our two surrogates each carry the twins. Our four children are all from the same donor, so they are all in fact half-siblings. It's amazing, on the one hand. On the other hand, when you work with third world countries like we do today, this means somewhere in India or in Nepal, there are frozen embryos that belong to me and my partner. The process is frightening and bizarre, but we have no other option. Our need to be parents is so strong. It doesn't matter how ethical I am in the day-to-day, -day, and the surrogacy procedure may not be 100% ethical, despite the fact that in the dream sold to me and my partner, the money we paid should have paid the surrogate in a phenomenal way. In practice, we discovered that this only after the children were born, a random conversation with a surrogate in the Israeli embassy. The amount we thought we were paying the surrogate was not what they received. That is, we spent 800 to 900,000 shekels on four kids. In the US, one child is approximately six to 700,000. Altogether, it cost us approximately one million shekel. All four were our children from day one. There was no issue. The children are not really Jewish. That is, my son was circumcised, but I don't have a way of converting them. They can convert independently once they turn 18. The problem with reform conversion is that it would make it difficult if they ever wanted to convert through the rabbinate. It would be easier for them to convert as non-Jews than as reformed Jews. So I am putting that aside. I raise them and educate them as Jews. I'm very fond of this little piece of the pregnant bellies. Uh, we're not used to seeing pregnant bellies bare, naked, and they to me look like a creature with a woman breathing. And then finally, we have the hologram over here. Uh, the idea of a, of a baby floating in, in space, that's the idea here. We started going into hospitals to begin IVF. So this is a couple. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Ramban Shul. As you know, the Fifth Jerusalem Biennale is currently in full swing in many sites around the city. And we are thrilled that our own Ruth Schreiber has chosen Ramban to be one of those sites. Her fascinating exhibition, Where Do Babies Come From?, is currently open in our Byzantine Hall down below. And if you haven't had a chance to visit, I strongly urge that you do so. It's quite remarkable. There's probably no one more appropriate or qualified to address some of these issues than our speaker tonight, Rabbi Professor Avram Steinberg, who is well known to many in this audience, is a pediatric neurologist, an internationally acknowledged expert on medical ethics, and an Israel Prize laureate in the field of Torah literature. The title of Professor Steinberg's address is Halachic Solutions to Medical Challenges. I have much pleasure in inviting Professor Steinberg to address us. Thank you, my colleague from many years ago. It was a wonderful eulogy. <laughs> so we are here to talk about some of the mysteries of the beginning of uh, human beings. And it is in coordination with the uh, exhibition that uh, Mrs. Uh, Ruth Schreiber uh, is part of, and uh, really the gift of art is a gift of God, but you need motivation, you need excitement, you need enthusiasm in order to bring out the talent given to you 
and I'm sure that everyone that will go through this uh, exhibition will have great enjoyment. As we all know, fertility is a blessing. Infertility is a curse. We know from our ancient history that our mothers, the foremothers, were uh, infertile and they suffered greatly. Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Hannah, the mother of Shmuel, the mother of Shimshon. There were many women who had difficulties to become pregnant and only miraculously or through prayers they became pregnant. And indeed the words of Rachel, Hava Libanim, Bim Ein Meta Anochi, is really I think the, the hallmark of what a woman feels when she can't have children as uh, nature supposedly should have given her this power. We find actually more on the side of the female, the sorrow, but I think that uh, from the male side there is equally sorrow if uh, they can't have children. I mean, it's, it's once a couple becomes a couple, they become one unit. And if this suffers, this suffers and vice versa. So it's really a cause of suffering. It is a philosophical, ethical, and halachic debate if infertility is regarded as an illness. The same way as someone who has the Havdil cancer or heart problems, he has an insufficiency of his capability to have children, either the male or the female, and that's a form of a disease. But interestingly, are you allowed to desecrate Shabbos to treat infertility? Is it a disease in this sense that it is on the verge of pikuach nefesh? Hava libanim v'imayin metanoch, it's a feeling of dying. That is debatable halachically, but even if we don't accept it to this level, it is still a form of a disease, of an insufficiency, of a function, of part of the body, which is a very important part, because it does not only serve yourself, it serves the future generations. And that's the Robert Steinberg, it's been an honor for Kilat Ramban for the Jerusalem Biennale of Contemporary Jewish Art, and personally for Ruthie and me, that you graciously agreed to address us this evening. You triggered Ruth's curiosity about the subject when we heard your talk in the Knesset in 2016, when you chose the first entry, I think it's the first one, in the Talmudic Encyclopedia, the word av, and revealed how many definitions there could now be, and gave us an insight into the complex halachic and ethical implications. We have been privileged to know your family for maybe more than 40 years, and the wider community has been enriched and guided by your scholarship, which you share so generously and carry so modestly. Thank you. <laughs>